Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? This program that is dedicated to trying to achieve a better understanding of the Bible, which is God's Word. We spend the whole program thinking and talking and try, uh, and meditating on the Word of God, trying to think what can we understand better about it, because it is such a vital book, such an important book. No words could describe its importance and, and really do justice to it. It is simply... It is simply the most magnificent book that this world will ever know, and it is, yet it is difficult to understand, and we have to constantly pray for wisdom that God might open our spiritual understanding to what God is declaring there. But what is declared is super important to each and every one of us, and therefore, we can never, never waste our time as we try to think through what is God teaching in His Word. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. And so shall we take our first call uh, from our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, good evening. I would like to know uh, something about the Adventist Church. I've been told it's a cult. Uh, can you give me your views on that? Uh, uh, my views on which? The Adventist Church, Seventh Day Adventist Church. Oh, uh, my views on the on the Seventh Day and what the Seventh had Ad, uh, Seventh Day Adventists teach. Yeah, the problem is they have a gospel that is not the gospel of salvation. It is a gospel that starts with the Bible. But then they have added to it the writings of Ellen G. White, who had a series of visions, and amongst these visions there was a halo around the fourth commandment, that were, which is concerned with the seventh-day Sabbath, and that is their divine authority. Now, the Bible warns that if we add to the words of the prophecy of this book, this book referring to the Bible, then God will add to us our, His pledge, the pledge written herein. That is, we're still subject to judgment, and uh, and so unfortunately, that whole religion is uh, made up by man, and it is not from, uh, it is not blessed by God. There's no possibility of salvation, and that's why uh, they have some, uh, many doctrines that are not uh, in accordance with the Bible, doctrines such as that we still have to keep the seventh-day Sabbath, uh, doctrines such as that there is no hell, uh, eternal damnation, and uh, so on. And, and uh, that's what happens when, when a man uh, sets up their own kind of a gospel. So I could never recommend it to anybody. I understand. I've um, visited that church with a friend, actually, and I was made aware of Ellen G. White and some of her writings, but what I've heard was teachings based on health, nutrition, so I really didn't find a problem. Can you tell me specifically what she says that's wrong? Well, the, the very fact that she claims that she got a vision from heaven is shows that it, that it is wrong because that's not possible there is once the bible was completed and it was completed almost two thousand years ago there it was there would never be any further revelation from god and the fact that she claims she has a revelation from god and uh, the church the seventh day adventist church are are believing that to be true uh, the whole business is wrong because those visions she had could never have come from God. And so we have to decide what kind of a gospel we want to follow. The true gospel 
is circumscribed by the Bible. It alone and in its entirety is the divine word. And any time we have any kind of a gospel where they claim, yes, the Bible is the word of God, but there's also this vision or this voice that we or someone heard or this uh, this uh, a dream or vision that someone had that that also is from God then immediately you've got a false gospel you've got a gospel that is designed by men and not by God uh, it is true that people do receive supernatural information but it uh, but it does not come from God God will not violate his own rules uh, but Satan you see goes about as an angel of light uh, he comes speaking just like the Lord Jesus Christ and there are those who fall for this and decide oh well that certainly sounds godly that certainly sounds like it's a message from God and they accept it to be from God but it cannot be from God and if it is truly supernatural it had to come from Satan because he is a permitted to break the silence between the supernatural and the natural so it's a very serious matter a dreadfully serious matter and and uh, the only safe place to be is to trust the Bible alone and in its entirety but only the Bible for divine truth and not look anywhere else can I ask you one more quick question uh, I would like to know what is this about say not eating pork or shrimp I don't see the big deal. If you say you're grace, why can't you, you, you eat it? Uh, what, what is that? Uh, what are you asking about? Okay, in that church, I've heard that in their health message that eating pork or, say, shellfish is wrong. Can you explain to me if, if that has any uh, if, if validation to it? No, again. I, uh, in the Old Testament, God arbitrarily made certain meats unclean, like pork and and uh, and uh, uh, horse meat and and uh, rattlesnake and so on. Uh, uh, only a few meats were considered to be clean. Now that was it did not necessarily mean that those meats that were called clean were any better than the other meats, but that was God's uh, the command that there were clean and unclean because that was part of the ceremonial law of the Old Testament but once we get to the New Testament where we are the beginning with the coming of Christ and after uh, all meat is clean you can eat pork today just as quickly and uh, and uh, correctly as you can eat beef or chicken or anything else it's there's you can eat rattlesnake or you can eat horse meat or you can eat any kind of meat uh, without re running the risk of, of running afoul of any biblical r law now any church that is going to establish laws about clean and unclean meats is again going against the Bible they are simply setting up their own rules but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening hi i have two comments yes okay if god wanted us to conclude that the great tribulation would go the full 23 years he probably would have written in revelation 8 1 that there was a silence in heaven for exactly the space of one hour but he doesn't say that he says that there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Well, because it's not the silence is not worldwide for the, uh, th that is, the silence for about a half hour was worldwide. It was in the local congregations. It was throughout the world. No one was becoming saved during that first part of the Great Tribulation. But once we got past that, first part which is called about a half hour and got into the second part of the tribulation the silence continues in the churches but not in the world in the world we have exactly the opposite it's a time of jubilee it's a time when god is saving a great multitude which no man can number 
And so there's, it's, the Bible has stated it, uh, or I, we have come to a correct understanding of that verse, I believe. And God okay. speaks about the whole period of the Great Tribulation as one hour. And he speaks about this first part as about a half hour. Actually, it was uh, a, a, a smaller part than the second part. The silence that you are saying occurred in the whole world between 1988 and 1994 would have lasted for exactly the space of half an hour, and God makes it very clear in Revelation 8:1 that the silence lasted for about the space of half an hour. I don't know. Well, but you, you see, uh, when we work through the calendar of the Bible, we find that that everything fits into place, and God has. Uh, worked out his timeline in a very very carefully worked out fashion it's not by by or in arbitrary fashion in any way and then we find that the first part that about that time of about a half hour uh, is identical to the 2300 evening mornings of Daniel 8 which is a little over six years and we find that the second part is about 17 years for a total of 23 years and so there is no contradiction there if God had said there was silence in heaven for a half hour then we would have to be looking for a uh, half of 23 years if the total tribulation period was 23 years but because he uses the word about half hour it indicates that it's a it's a first part of that tribulation period not necessarily uh, exactly one half of it but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. In uh, reference to your teachings of the end of the, uh, the end of the church age and the end of time, you often quote that uh, Noah was told uh, certain things would happen at a certain time. And and I must say to you that he was given very specific, direct revelation. And when God did speak to him, or any of the prophets, it was definite dates given. It was never, uh, an ins we could never say that they said something, in there's a strong likelihood, like you're teaching. Well, that's, but you see, we have to teach with the light that God has given us. Now, uh, uh, God has, while he told uh, uh, Jonah that uh, in Nineveh would be destroyed in 40 days, God has not said that the world will come to an end in the year 2011. He's gotten very close to saying that when we read 2 Peter 3, where he says a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, and, uh, and seven days, uh, in seven days, uh, uh, God said, uh, told Noah that everybody had to get in the ark because a flood would come, and when we tie that together, we find that uh, 2011 is exactly 7,000 years after 4990, the year 4990 B.C. when the flood came. But still, we can't say uh, absolutely God said that Christ is going to come in the year 2011. So we have, Brother to, Camping. we have to be very careful in choosing our language. Brother Camping, that's my um, contention with you. Unless God said it absolutely... I don't think we have any biblical validation to say absolutely in the strong likelihood. God does not teach that anywhere in the Bible that uh, something will happen in a strong likelihood. Well, but but we, as we, uh, I mean, what is the point you want to make? You, uh, is your point that either we say absolutely it's going to be, or else we don't offer any kind of a date? Is that your is that your Complaint? I would say unless we could say, thus saith the Lord, we shouldn't say it. Well, you know, when Christ, for example, I, uh, taught about baptism, did he give a, an exact statement? You must baptize a baby, uh, a sprinkle water on that baby. And the answer is no. He, sp he, sp he used a lot of language about baptism. And so some churches concluded that we have to pour we have to pour water on others sprinkled others immersed, and uh, and can we say 
that they shouldn't have been baptizing at all because God did not, uh, did not stipulate that in a precise language? Of course not. We go and we go into this with everything in the Bible. We, we present what we do know as carefully as we do know. And, and uh, if we can say something absolute, we do. For example, when we say Christ is going to come again, and judge the world. We say that absolutely. We don't say there's a strong likelihood. We know that absolutely he will come. When we say that he came anything in the history of the church, or excuse me, the history of the world as it's reported in the Bible, we can say absolutely Israel was destroyed in the year 709 B.C. We can say that because that is a fact of history. But as we project into the future, or as there are certain uh, doctrines of, of uh, theological doctrines that we teach, we have to say from everything we can learn in the Bible, this is the way we are to understand this. But remember, God himself said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, fine, but also for correction. And so we have to remember that, uh, that from time to time we may have to be corrected. And, and if we're going to walk very humbly, we're going to uh, uh, recognize the areas where, where we cannot know absolutely. And, and, uh, and yet we have to teach what we can know about it. Because God on the other side of the coin absolutely warned that when... You, the watchmen saw the enemy coming. They had to sound the alarm, and so that's what we have to do. Brother Camping, uh, I, I'm I'm in total agreement with most of your teachings. It's just this um, end of time teaching that I disagree with. And what I'm trying my point is um, we we shouldn't look at um, churches down through the centuries and say, well, you know, they didn't ba they baptized, and maybe they took this verse wrong from the Bible, and they did this. That still gives us no biblical validation to say. That we have to be able to say, thus saith the Lord, such as what you were saying, Jesus is Lord, if we die without Christ, we'll end up in hell. These are all absolute statements that can be backed up with Bible passages. You cannot back up that the year may, the end of time may end in 2011 in strong likelihood. You cannot back that up with, with the way God wants us to teach from the Bible. Well, that's, what you're, that's your conclusion, but you have to again ask the question, why did God give us so much information about time, an enormous amount of information about time. Why did he lay out for us the whole time pattern of history? Why did he give us the calendar of the, of the age of the earth so we know that our creation occurred in 11,013 B.C.? Why, uh, why does he give us all that information? Is, it, is that just... Uh, curious information or is that is God teaching us something and so we learn everything we can about it and then we see how far uh, how much God has really taught us and and we know that that time is of essence that we learn that everything has a time and so we try to fit it all together but we do it very humbly we don't we don't uh, say, well, based on everything I find in the Bible, I, I am positive that year 2000, whatever it may be, is going to be the end of the year, uh, end of time. Uh, we, 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 don't want to, we don't want to say more than what we can, are allowed to say from what our knowledge is. Now, maybe, maybe before we're all done, maybe someone We'll read something in the Bible that will even be more insistent. I, I can say this, that in all of my study I find that, uh, and I continually work on this and continually compare Scripture with Scripture, I find again and again that the year 2011 looks like that is the year, and I find no other year as a possible year. And yet I would be uh, way beyond my authority to say, I know this absolutely will be the year. Now, I'm Look, sorry if you don't like that, but that's the, way it's how I, that's the way I teach it. Brother Camping, what I'm trying to say is what you were saying is true with uh, the dates in the Bible. But God is very specific where he'll give a verse. He'll say something like, uh, in the second day of the third month of the year, whatever, 
And that's very specific. And if he wanted us to know when he's coming back exactly for the people to know, he would have said it just like that. In the first year of the seventh month, and such and such, the Lord will, will return. And what you're doing is you're saying, well, he gave dates here and time passages here. And so we have now have the biblical validation to forecast his second coming. And I just think we're, you're going down the wrong path that way. Well, that may be your, your concern. But I'll tell you, uh, when God has given us as much information as he had, we have to put that into place. And we have to, uh, we're not uh, incorrect at all in drawing some conclusions. Now, if you don't like that, that's fine. You don't have to teach that. You don't have to buy it either. But I have to stand before God with my conscience, and as I am, as as a Bible teacher, and I I feel compelled, absolutely compelled, to teach these things. I would feel like I was I was being uh, to totally derelict in my responsibility as a teacher if I did not teach these things this way. Well, I appreciate but, your ministry, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. How are you? I've been listening to you for a while now, and I just, uh, I just want to try to maybe uh, put something together here, and I just want to do this as brief as I can. And being that I know that you're pretty reasonable, uh, I'd appreciate it if you can just let me get through this, and I'd just like to hear your response to it. Uh, I've been listening to your program for some time now, and what I feel is that is that you make God sound like some kind of a boogeyman that's going to come and send us all into a bottomless pit. And there isn't anything uh, any of us excuse, can tell you to do about it. Excuse me, excuse me. Would you be kind enough to talk a little more slowly? Because I, I'm having a little difficulty following you. Speak a little more slowly. Okay. What I feel is that uh, I've been listening to your program and that you kind of make it sound as though uh, God is going to send us all into this bottomless pit and there isn't anything any of us can do about it. Um, I would just like to take a few quotes from the Bible. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Ask for this gift and it shall be given you. What kind of a father refuses a son? If you who are imperfect know how to give what's good to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask him? Whoever does for the least of my brethren, he does it to me. God sent his only son into the world not to condemn it, but that his son, um, but not to condemn it, but that the world may be saved through him. There is uh, two stories. There's a story with the uh, father, the one son wants to, uh, his inheritance now to go off on his own. But after a while, he comes to his senses and it goes back to the father. And the father is filled with compassion. Yeah, they run now, down. Now, now, excuse me a moment. Now, you, you, can, you are selecting certain verses that uh, that uh, will fit your particular uh, uh, conclusion that you would like to come to. But you must remember that when we study the Bible, we have to read everything in the Bible. Now, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 15, God has, uh, been, in the previous chapters, he has been declaring, I am going to destroy uh, Judah and Jerusalem and the temple. And, and uh, he's using these as an example. I'm going to d destroy the local congregations and bring judgment. And then he says in Jeremiah 15, uh, and, and, and in, fact, in fact, the argument was in, in the previous verses was exactly like you're saying, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as the, uh, uh, the argument is being made in verse 20 of Jeremiah 14. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain, or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord, our God? Therefore, we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. In other words, they are saying to God, Come on, Lord, you, you really wouldn't do the terrible things that you're talking about, would you? Here comes God's answer. Then saith the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind, and these were some of the, the two, two of the greatest prophets of, 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 of the history of the world, 
Though they stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight, and let them go forth. And it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord. Now this is God speaking. Such as for death to death, and such as for the sword to the sword, and such as are for famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy, and so on. In other words, this idea of coming to God and say, but after all, God, you are merciful. After all, you have, have, uh, uh, you're a God of love, and so on. Yes, yes, God has a long 13,000-year history uh, in which he has demonstrated these attributes of God, patience and love and forgiveness and, and mercy and, and, and so on. But finally... God has an end, has an end, and he's showing us that he does have an end, and then, then uh, uh, it, no one's going to change God's mind. And this is where we are as we're approaching Judgment Day. There is a Judgment Day coming. There will be the penalty of eternal damnation that will be assessed there's no question about it at all. And we can plead with God, oh, but, oh, Lord, you're merciful. Oh, Lord, you're this, you're that. Yes, he is, and he has been, and has been, and has been. But finally, there comes an end. And, uh, and uh, that end is the end of the world. And that's why the Bible goes on to say the smoke of their torment goes on forever and ever and they have no rest. That's why the Bible says there will be many in that day that will say, Lord, Lord, we have done mighty wonderful things in your name, and the Lord will say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So we don't. We, we have to read the whole Bible, and not just the Bible, the comforting statements about God's, uh, God's uh, mercy and so on. Yes, they're great comfort, but finally there comes an end. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. How are you? I was just speaking with you, and you, you cut me off. You know, I mean, I, I, I listen to your program. I, you know, I'm trying to call and voice my opinion, and you give yours, but then you don't want to hear the response to that. You know, I mean, don't you think it's only fair that you should be open-minded well, to hear what somebody me. else has to say? Excuse me, I, I did not cut you off. If, if, you, if your line dropped, we came to the end of that. We came to the station break. But, but go ahead. What is your? I, uh, I was. I thought I was answering your question. And what you're saying that there will be an end. I believe that. I've read that. I believe that. But what I've noticed about your program that's that's a little troubling to me is that it seems as though um, that. You, well, I understand we have to look at the whole Bible, but I feel as though you're looking at the verses that you want and you're giving your interpretation, and then you're turning around and saying that that's the Word of God. And I think that that's unfair to your listeners to say that rather than to say that, that that's your interpretation of what's being said. And also... Uh, well, well, excuse me, could you please be specific? You know, just to be general. Okay. Speaking general doesn't help. Okay, what, like, what are you I, thinking okay, about? What, I, what I'm saying is, I, I'm, when it comes to being, I wasn't talking about just the end of the world, but when it comes to being saved, there are specific examples that Jesus gives throughout the gospel in which, yes, he does say, and I believe it, that it is God who does the saving. We by ourselves are not capable of doing that. But there are too many verses, there are too many things that are said that Jesus is asking for us to go to God, to go to God, to pray to God, to try to to appeal to God to help us to, to to possibly save us, and and sometimes you make it sound as though that that's that that's that that's completely impossible. And if that's completely impossible, then what is even the purpose of spreading the word? What is even the purpose of the gospel? What is the purpose of even Jesus coming into the world if 
uh, you, you know, to, to, to uh, teach people how to worship God if, if it's completely out of our hands and it's nothing that we can do about it. And, and so it sounds as though your, your interpretation when it comes to being saved is such that God is, is setting us up for a complete disaster, is setting well, us up excuse, to be thrown into uh, hell, uh, and right. there's nothing we can do. I understand your point. Now, the, the, the problem is that we have to read the whole Bible. And uh, it's just, let me use the illustration because that will cut through it all. Here God commands, uh, I'm speaking from John 11, God commands the dead Lazarus who had been dead for four days, he's a stinking corpse, and God commands him to come forth. Now why in the world would Christ command that dead corpse to come forth, speaking to that dead corpse like it was a living being? And there God is illustrating, giving us an outstanding illustration of how we are to understand the Bible. God is speaking through the Bible to spiritually dead corpses. That's what he emphasizes in, in uh, Ezekiel 37, as he talks about the valley of dry bones and asks the question, can these bones live? We are like a valley of dry bones. And so Christ is speaking to us. You've got to believe. You've got to repent. You've got to seek me. You've got to turn away from your sins. You've got to do this. You've got to do the other thing. Exactly as he commanded Lazarus, come forth. But he's speaking to dead, spiritually dead people, like Jesus was speaking to a physically dead corpse. Now, uh, this is what we read in the Bible. Now, the fact is that Lazarus did come forth. Now, how did that happen? Is it because he, that, that dead corpse, initiated anything at all? We, we, uh, we have to answer, of course not. He was, it was a stinking corpse. Well, then how did he come forth? Well, it meant that as God is speaking and commanding that, that dead corpse to come forth, he was also qualifying and, and giving that corpse life so that it could obey. And that's exactly a picture of salvation. He tells the world, you've got to repent and all these other things. And he's speaking to dead corpses. And yet amongst them here and there, there is one that does do, that does believe. And how did that happen? Exactly the same way that Lazarus came out, Christ had to qualify that dead, spiritually dead person by giving him spiritual life. And so he became, he gave the evidence of having become saved. Okay, you know, I just also wanted to ask about this, the, uh, the church age and the, uh, you're saying that we are in the uh, time of tribulation, and I've, I've read that. And just what I'm a little curious about is there's much things that are there are many things that are written there that seem as though we could apply to many times throughout history. Like for example, like there was the bubonic plague in you know the 1300s to the 1500s, and you know one out of every three Europeans died. We've had two world wars. Can we can we honestly look at this and say that this is this is the worst the world has ever been since the beginning? Not physically, no, not physically. In fact, uh, uh, I, as well as a great many others throughout our pilgrimage, have thought when the Bible talked about great tribulation that it would be a time of great physical distress, uh, like uh, from man's inhumanity to man or through pestilence like a bubonic plate or, or whatever. But, uh, but when we uh, become better acquainted with the Bible, we find, no, that is not it. There's a greater distress, and that is a spiritual distress, just as, as the end of man going to hell is far more terrible than any physical death, however terrible that physical death might be. But uh, there, the, uh, the, you asked a very fair question. How do we know that now this is the time? It's very significant, amongst other things. There's a lot of uh, things I could say here, but let me just offer one. Uh, God gave a very dramatic clue 
as to uh, about when all of these things would happen because both in Mark 13 and in Matthew 24 God said when you see the fig tree in leaf then you will know that summer is nigh and then you will know that all of these things are happening all right uh, when we study the Bible we know that God very definitely used the nation of Israel as a symbolized it by a fig tree in Mark 11 when he cursed the fig tree and said may you never bear fruit uh, if we understand that correctly we can know that that was speaking about the the nation of Israel that were typified by a fig tree but here in our generation for the first time in almost 19 almost 2000 years uh, Israel that had been destroyed in AD 70 so they lost their homeland they had no homeland uh, they were no longer a viable nation amongst the nations of the world for over over uh, almost 1900 years and in 1948 almost miraculously they became a viable nation again amongst the nations of the world uh, and they had a homeland namely the land of Israel and so the fig tree is in leaf now it didn't say it would be in fruit and then uh, other language emphasized that it would never come into fruit again that is it would never trust as a nation in the Lord Jesus then it says when you see this uh, the fig tree and leaf you'll know that summer is nigh now when we go through the Bible we find that summer is normally associated with harvest time even as it is in practical living uh, harvest time is it during the summer months well what summer is that uh, when at uh, when it coincides when the, with the church is going uh, more and more in uh, in uh, uh, becoming more and more decadent and 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 going away from the truth uh, what summer is that and then God indicates that there is the latter rain that there are a great multitude which no man could number that would be coming in and lo and behold in the year 1994 was a jubilee year which he ushered in the final jubilee period that we are now in so summer was nigh was very close at hand in 1948 and then it says that all these things will take place and when we search through uh, the whole chapter of Matthew 24 or Mark 13 we find uh, that uh, they're all in evidence for example false prophets and false Christ will arise with signs and wonders to lead astray if possible even the elect this is this is the, fr uh, the first time in the history of the church that signs and wonders and tongues and all that kind of thing uh, visions and so on were in, uh, in evidence uh, like they never had been in evidence before like they are today and so on and so you see God has given us enough language as we if, if go through the Bible so that we can begin to see how all of these things fit together very very uh, very definitely but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum God's on there no, God. I'm sorry Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, good evening. Yes, um, I've been listening to your program for a while. Yes. And um, I've overheard you said that once you receive salvation, you cannot lose it. Right? Why can't you lose it? Why can't you lose it? If because it's once really you're a child of God... No, you can't lose it because it means that all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for by the Lord Jesus. Unless, they, if, unless every sin a person would ever commit in his whole lifetime had been paid for by the Lord Jesus, he could never become saved. Uh, because uh, what, any sin, whatever sin, however small, uh, requires uh, the payment of eternal damnation and so Christ either had to pay for every sin 
that we committed or else uh, it wouldn't help if he uh, had paid for any of them. And so if, we, if all of our sins have been paid for, it means there's no, nothing we could do that could make us lose our salvation. Yes. The reason why I brought the situation up was because there was this uh, scripture in the Bible. Um, read Hebrews 6, 4 to 8. Yeah, Hebrews 6. Yes. Yeah, well, see, that is, that, that is a very difficult passage until our day. Uh, no one has really been able to understand that. I know I've struggled with that through the years, trying to, trying to figure out why God used that particular language. But that language identifies with the end of the church age, the fact that uh, it's speaking here of the local congregation in which they have tasted of the heavenly gift in which they had been made partakers of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit throughout the church age had worked there, in which they have tasted the good word of God because they had been the custodian of the Bible, the, the caretaker of the Bible for years and years and years, and so on. But now that we're at the end of the church age and the Holy Spirit is no longer present there, if, the, if there's no sin th that, that is committed within that local congregation that can be forgiven, it's, uh, the, uh, there's no salvation going on there at all. And that's a very, very dreadful situation. It's one of the reasons why this is called a time of great tribulation. That, uh, that, uh, that now nobody in a local congregation who's not already saved can become saved there. If he's elective God, God is going to drive him out or get him out of there before the end so that he can become saved because the Holy Spirit will work outside of the congregation but not within the congregation. I see. Yes, there is this other verse in Scripture, um, Matthew 24. Uh, verse 15 to 16, is that describing the end of the church age? That is describing the end of the church age when the holy place, which are the local congregations, now have, have been uh, put under the rule of Satan. He is the abomination of desolation. And the true believers are to flee. They are to flee to the mountains, that is, to flee to Christ. Uh, to God himself uh, and put no trust in their church any longer. Oh, you see, this is where I find it very confusing because there are many times where God uses the word church, like in um, Revelation 2, uh, let's see, no, in Matthew 16, verse 18. It's, but uh, you, you, we have to look at the context now, for example, uh, 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 in, Ma in Revelation 2 or Revelation 3, God is talking about seven churches that are external, physical churches. That, like the First Baptist Church on the corner or the Second Reformed Church on the other corner, and so on. They are local congregations in which there are true believers within as well as those who are not true believers. Satan is already uh, present in some of them because there are unsaved people who are still under his authority and uh, and they've uh, the church at Ephesus has already lost its first love the church at Sardis only has a few true believers left in it it's already virtually a dead church okay on the other hand when we look at other some other passages where we find the word church uh, frequently it is talking about not the local congregation, but the eternal church. And we can tell by the context. For example, you mentioned uh, Matthew 16. Uh, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we know, we know that uh, the gates of hell has to do with the wrath of God. That is the end of those who they end up in hell if they're under the wrath of God and they're under the wrath of God if they are not saved well now within the local congregation 
uh, that that may have a lot of unsaved people who are still under the wrath of God so they're still the gates of hell can prevail against them but the, if, the, if you're a true believer then you are part of the eternal church that is you are safe and secure in Christ your sins have all been paid for therefore the gates of hell the wrath of God can never have a claim on you because all of your sins have been paid for so Matthew 16 is not talking about a local congregation that would be impossible it's talking about those who are true believers I said yes um, last but not least um, if you must leave your churches what about communion well but you see the the God gave two ceremonial laws to the New Testament church communion and the, and the uh, and the uh, water uh, water baptism now neither of these have any spiritual uh, advantage to the person they are signs that is they are teaching tools to help direct our our focus on the cross and on the washing away of our sins and on the completion of our salvation when Christ comes again but the church has done exactly the same thing Old Testament Israel did with their ceremonial laws their ceremonial laws were the laws about burnt offerings and blood sacrifices and seventh day Sabbath and so on and they concluded that by the keeping of those ceremonial laws the burnt offerings the blood sacrifices the seventh day Sabbath and the others that thereby they were right with God thereby they were receiving huge spiritual blessing their trust was in the keeping of those laws and yet the Bible reports to us in Romans chapter 9 that they perished because of unbelief in other words they uh, they could keep those ceremonial laws very rigorously and religiously and yet it availed them nothing and the New Testament church fell into exactly the same snare they put an enormous amount of, of spiritual weight on water baptism in fact that becomes the centerpiece of many many churches uh, and in the communion table that becomes the center of, of all of the spiritual activity as if there is where they're going to get spiritual help from and they didn't realize they were only teaching uh, methods teaching tools and uh, once God finished with the nation of Israel the New Testament church didn't keep the burnt offerings and blood sacrifices and the seventh day Sabbath any longer and now once we're past the church age we don't keep the water baptism and and the Lord's table ceremonial laws any longer because I uh, uh, we don't have the environment where that can be done in the Old Testament the burnt offerings and the blood sacrifices were under the uh, authority or under the spiritual care of the priests and and the Levites who were uh, who were uh, servicing in the temple or in the synagogue in uh, in the uh, New Testament age the uh, the uh, water baptism and the communion table were under the care and supervision of the spiritual overseers the elders and the deacons and the pastor but now that we don't have them we uh, cannot observe those anymore and they're not important any longer they were only teaching tools now now we have we're focusing right on the Bible and we have we have more Bibles than ever available we have uh, we can teach more extensively and intensively than ever before so uh, though it, it isn't important that we try to have a communion service any longer but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening uh, Harold yes um, can a person understand every doctrine in the Bible well enough to teach it so others can understand it? Or are there some doctrines we just are not going to be able to ever understand properly? 
oh, there are some doctrines we cannot understand properly. God indicates in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, I believe the secret things belong to God. For example, if someone asks me, can you please explain how God could be one God and yet three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Uh, uh, they're asking me that as a teacher, and I have to answer very honestly, no, I can't tell you. I can't un help you to understand that at all. I know it's true. I know we have to accept it. But but I have no way of understanding what God, uh, how how that can all be, and so I don't even try to teach it. Now let's look at a passage in First Corinthians chapter two, verse ten, and also verse sixteen. All right, First Corinthians chapter two, verse ten, and verse sixteen. There we read. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Are you in 1 Corinthians 2.10? Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading 1 Corinthians 1.10. No, no, no. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, uh, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And then verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, what is your qu uh, question? Well, isn't it saying in the first uh, verse 10 that the Holy Spirit searches the depths of, of God, correct? Well, yes. Okay, now we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Yes. So the Holy Spirit could teach us, if the Holy Spirit wanted to, yes. the depths, all the, whatever um, the Lord wanted us to know. And we know that everything in the Bible that was written down, God wants us to know it. Oh, excuse me. Now, you, you, that, you that's what you, he, we, we have to know about it, but that doesn't mean we have to understand it. You know, God will lead us into truth. The Holy Spirit is eternal God himself. And uh, and uh, you, in fact, said it correctly if he wants to. And God has not given us minds to understand an infinite God. And there are those who insist, oh, now, wait a minute. The Bible says it talks about God, therefore we ought to know. Well, no, they haven't read the whole Bible. They haven't read that there are some things that God doesn't want us to know. And so we wait upon God. As a matter of fact, any time we study the Bible, we have to be very humble before it. And, uh, and uh, God also has a timeline for revealing truth. It may be something we don't understand today, and we will understand a lot more, more sometime down uh, later on in time, uh, uh, because there is such a thing as progressive revelation. But uh, But... Uh, when we start talking about God himself, we have to say we don't know. Or when we start asking questions, how is it that mankind fell into sin? I don't know. I don't know. How, did, how, how is it that the angels, some of them fell into sin? I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us enough information for us to dare make a judgment on that, and so we shouldn't even try. But Bible, thank you for calling and sharing. Herald, 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 herald. Yeah. The Bible says right here that we have the mind of Christ. Well, but that doesn't mean that we, that, that you have to read this, that there are certain things that, that remain with God. The secret things uh, remain with God. You, you can't, uh, you, 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 we yeah. can't read anything in, in, uh, in, uh, in, and make a doctrine out of it just based on that verse. We have to read everything in the light of the whole Bible. We read in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now, God reveals certain things, and he, but he doesn't, he's not obligated to reveal everything. He doesn't reveal to us, for example, when he, when he spoke and uh, and said, let there be light, or, or, or let the earth bring forth vegetation. He doesn't tell us how he did that. There, there are a lot of things that, he, that we have to say we don't know. We don't know, and we have to walk very humbly. 
But some people in their arrogance, in their spiritual arrogance, they say, well, you know, God, uh, if we have the mind of Christ, we can know everything. Well, they're, they're not reading the whole Bible. They're just listening to their own pride and trying to satisfy their own pride. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, I'd like to bring up two subjects. One of them is on miracles. Now, did, have you said that God does not perform miracles in these days? He performs one great miracle again and again. is the miracle of salvation. Now, we have to define miracle. A miracle is where God sets aside the normal rules by which he governs the universe and, and accomplishes his will. Hold on, I'll be right back with you. We have a caller on the line who's asking about miracles. You, you know, we use that word miracle quite loosely. Let's say someone uh, has been very ill and, and the doctor's prognosis was that uh, maybe she's going to die of this because she is very, very ill with whatever. And then uh, 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 suddenly almost she begins to get well again and, and more quickly than expected. And so we use the word, oh, a miracle was done. No, a miracle was not done. It was simply that that uh, there's a lot about sickness and disease we don't know and doctors don't know about. And, and he made a, an incorrect prognosis. The, the fact is she was not that near death as he, she, as he, as the doctor thought she was. But when Jesus walked on water, he had to set aside the law of gravity. Otherwise, he could not walk on water. That is not happening anywhere in the world today. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he had to set aside all kinds of laws uh, that he, by which he governs the universe. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, that is not happening today. Uh, when, uh, when a man had a withered hand that had never, never grown, a little atrophied hand that he was born with, and suddenly it's a whole hand. That's a miracle. There's all kinds of laws had to be set aside to accomplish that. But uh, none of those things are happening today. Now, there are many miracles that are being counterfeited. There are evangelists who are trying to get people to become saved uh, by their man-made doctrines. And, and uh, so they, they fake uh, uh, miraculous cures of one kind or another. Uh, in order to the feeling that the end justifies the means and so while they're using lies uh, to convince the listener or the watcher that a miracle was done uh, they're happy because then that person receives Christ well the whole business is a man-made venture it has nothing to do with the salvation of the Bible at all all right and my question my next question still on the same subject is does everyone at Family Radio believe that? Because today during the prayer time program, there was a prayer made um, for God to heal or cure someone of cancer. Well, the fact of praying for healing, that's, that's not wrong. We, Any time we uh, have a, a distress in our life, a loved one is ill or we ourselves are ill, to go to the Lord and ask, Oh, Lord, have mercy. Is it possible? Is it possible? that you might make me well again, you would bless the medicine, and, and uh, that I could become well again. That, of course, is very, very, uh, we can come to God with all of our anxieties that God commands us to do that. But, uh, but to uh, 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 pray, oh, Lord, do a miracle and uh, instantly heal this person, no, that's asking God to do something that he won't do. God doesn't, doesn't do miracles today. But like I say, we use the word miracle very loosely. And so sometimes when we use the word miracle, we're thinking of, of, of something that has to happen that is not miraculous at all. But thank oh, you for... Oh, I'm sorry. I have one more question, but on a different subject. Yes. How accurate is the translation of the Bible into English? How... Accurate. I'm, I, I'm, repeat your question, please. How accurate 
is the translation of the Bible. Well, the translation of the Bible into the English language, particularly in the King James Version, is very accurate. It's not perfectly accurate, but it is very accurate. There are, uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, and then we'll run across a word that we say they did not translate it as perfectly as they should, but. Uh, uh, but uh, amongst all the Bibles, we'd have to say that the King James is more accurate than the others. Uh, but but it's not a not a perfect translation. And any competent teacher, Bible teacher, should always check a verse out by going to the uh, original Hebrew or the original Greek, so that uh, so that uh, we're really checking up on the translators. And once in a while, we'll find a verse where a word uh, would have been better translated in a different way, uh, or maybe it was a plural word and they translated it as a singular word. Well, occasionally that happens. But, uh, but uh, basically, as you read your King James Bible, you, you know it is the Word of God and, and you can trust it. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Uh, Brother Camping? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, I've been reading in Leviticus. Yes. And in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 26 through 28. Leviticus 19, 26. Let's look at that. We read... Uh, ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. Is that, the, is that it? Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou the, mar the corners of thy beard. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, what is your question? Um, in verse 26, where it talks about observing time, can you explain to me what that means? And then also, um, I don't understand 27 at all about the cutting of the well, hair. Does I, that mean the hair? or? I, I'm not sure I understand it. Let me talk about your second question first. Uh, if we tie 27 and 28 together, we see there that there is a, uh, these are practices that identify, apparently, I say apparently because I don't know this absolutely, but apparently identify with certain uh, pagan rites, uh, 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 false gospel rites, in connection with the death of someone. Uh, that, and, and we see this, for example, in, in the world today. There are people who put uh, uh, marks on their face uh, 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 or, their, or, or other parts of their body as some kind of as part of a religious activity. Uh, they uh, they do all kinds of strange things uh, when they're uh, uh, when they're thinking about the, the death of someone, and uh, I think that all of this has to do with the uh, worship of false gods. I, I I believe I don't say this absolutely, but I believe this is what is in view. Now, it's certainly uh, to use enchantments uh, and uh, and uh, to observe. Times uh, to observe times. Uh, let me see. Uh, that would be uh, um, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, referring to astro astrolog uh, astrology activity, uh, where uh, you're uh, looking for certain signs in the uh, in the um, moon or in the stars or whatever. It's, uh, it's possibly could go in that direction, but it all has to do with putting your trust in anything other than the God of the Bible. Anything, if our spiritual trust is in anything other than the God of the Bible, we are in deep trouble with God. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and then in chapter 21 in Leviticus, yes, um, verse 5, Leviticus 21, verse huh. 5. Okay. There we read, They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corners of their beard, nor make any cuttings of their flesh. The same idea. It's, re it's a repetition. Uh, uh, the, uh, 
the you see it's profaning the name of God. In other words, they are putting their trust in some kind of a heathen practice that uh, that if they do certain things, this the gods will be pleasing to them. And God is saying, no way, don't take do any activity. And in the worship of God, there is never a law that says we can't cut our beard or cut the corners of our beard or that we can't... Uh, 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 or that we have to put cuttings in our, in our flesh of some kind in the worship of God. That's not called for. It's only when you're observing false gods that you may find that you're commanded to do these things. It doesn't really but, pertain to today as far as uh, shaving your head bald. And I mean, unless, no, if people, unless you're if, doing it for us. No, if people want to have a, if a man wants to have a bald head, the Bible doesn't say there's anything wrong with that. Have a bald head. If they think they're more handsome that way, well, that's fine. There's no problem with that. Okay. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hi, Mr. Cameron. How you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Yes. Uh, second, I got two questions for you. Uh, Second Chronicles 11.15. Second Chronicles 11.15, and there we read, uh, and he ordained him. Now, this is talking about uh, Rehoboam, um, and uh, we read... Uh, uh, and he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils. That, that actually is for the goats, the he-goats, and for the calves which he had made. That word devil is, uh, the translators didn't quite know what to do with it, but it's a difficult word, but probably it has to do with, with rams that were being, uh, that were being offered as uh, burnt offerings. Oh, okay. Uh, my my second question is: uh, ha, Have you are you familiar with the CEC, the Charismatic Episcopal Church? No, I'm not. From, no, I'm sorry. I'm I'm not aware of that. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good evening, brother Captain. First. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions, and um, my first question is, you know, when the Lord first created the earth and Adam and Eve had sinned, and then the Moses era came in, he destroyed the earth with water. And then now, according to your teachings and what the Bible is stating, that he is going to uh, destroy the earth again with fire. Is there any meaning behind those elements as to how he will do this? And why? Well, uh, no. Uh, water is used in the Bible in the sense of the gospel. Uh, that is, a, we are washed with the washing of the word of God. And so water is a figure of the gospel. But the gospel is two-pronged. It brings salvation, but it also brings judgment. And, and uh, therefore, uh, God used water. Uh, to destroy the earth uh, in Noah's day. Now, fire is used invariably of the, uh, speaking of the, uh, uh, of Judgment Day, although, although the candlestick, uh, we could argue that the candle was a, was a little fire that was resulting from the burning of the candle, and it is the light of the world, but it also uh, and the light of the world is the gospel, and yet it is also uh, that which is talking about judgment. Or let's just say it one more way. Christ is the light of the world, and he comes both as the Savior, and he comes as the judge of all the earth. Um, my other question, Brother Kemping, thank you for that one. Uh, you clarified it. Um, is I had a family member recently try to destroy himself. Uh, through uh, jumping off a bridge. He's pretty banged up. Um, he'll probably never walk again. My question is, um, I'd like to go to him with the Bible, even though he cannot talk, he can't, and it'll be a while. Um, what is a good, specific 
chapter, verse in the Bible that I could read to him as to um, op- not opening his eyes, but to let him know that uh, the Lord is there. Well, the, the the whole Bible is the Word of God, and God can bless any scripture. The main thing is read to him the Bible, whether you're reading Genesis from Genesis 1 or Ezekiel 1 or Revelation 1 or John 1. Read the Bible to him so that he's under the hearing of the Word of God. Uh, now, you may want to read uh, maybe the third chapter of John. That's a good chapter to read, but... But there, or, uh, but really, uh, you know, uh, it's hard for me to to uh, say that one chapter of the Bible is more important than another because God wrote the whole Bible, and to, to say that God's words, some of God's words, are more important than others, I don't dare say that. Uh, that that's not what I meant. Was is there a certain verse that addresses? children, you know, of God uh, destroying themselves. Uh, well, no, the, Bible, you know, doesn't, means of the Bible doesn't speak of that. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, kill right. and self-destruction is killing. Right. Okay. But thank yep. you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kevin. Yes. Uh, when you say at the end of the conversation, uh, good night and uh, thank you for calling and sharing, you're not even sure that the people have finished with their statements. You know, and, and people have corrected you about this many times. And the Bible says, have respect for people with gray hair, right? And I have to exercise that towards you. But you should take correction. Well, before people are finished, you hang up the phone and you put the volume down. And you can't even hear, and you don't even respond if they're satisfied with their question and the answer. Well, now, excuse me. Now, you know, maybe if you could sit in my chair, you would do it perfectly. I'm not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination. I try to be a good host of this program. I keep in mind that this program is a teaching program program and sometimes we've had a person on for some minutes and uh, I find that we're not uh, it's not profitable in my judgment and I have to make a call on that I'm sorry uh, and uh, so at, a, at an appropriate moment I say well thank you for calling and go to the next caller so that we can go on and talk about some other things and now I uh, I uh, I'm sorry that this is not done perfectly. And not only, we also have engineers who are listening to the program, and when they find that it's uh, uh, that the, uh, qual- the quality uh, of the program has deteriorated for X for other reasons, and having nothing to do with the subject matter, sometimes they cut the program, the uh, caller off. And uh, of course, I have no control on that. So. It's not a perfect program. We do try to give everybody an opportunity. I'll tell you this. You try to call any talk program anywhere uh, and and see if you can just get on without being uh, first asked, what are you going to talk about and so on, and get their permission to come on. This is a program where anybody can come on, and we don't ask them, what do you want to talk about, or we're going to decide whether we want you to come on or not. So I believe that as talk programs go, we already go a long, long ways in the right direction. But I'll be the first one to agree, no, we don't do it perfectly by any means. And I don't know how we could do it perfectly. Okay, when you talk to a person, do you put the volume down so they can't answer you and, and, and speak? It's almost like a communist thing. You know? Oh, well, now, that's another subject. That's another subject. You see, on this program, we try to have dialogue. And if I am speaking and then the caller tries to interrupt, then it is, uh, uh, it, uh, it, we can't have dialogue, in other words, uh, with this going on. And so uh, I'm sorry, we have to do that in order to preserve 
this program so we have some kind of dialogue. Now, I admit, I can get guilty sometimes, too, where I interrupt too quickly, and I'm sorry that I do that, but uh, I, I, I sometimes I get a little bit uh, anxious about the subject matter that we're talking, and maybe I do it too quickly. But, but uh, basically, the idea of this program is dialogue. I understand, Mr. Camping. Thank you. But I want to say, so before you say, you know, before you say what you usually say, yes? Hello? Yes. Okay. What I'm saying is dialogue is a two-way street, and I understand your position. You're, 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 the, you're the host of the program. But I have called you a couple of times, and I haven't gotten an, an answer that's satisfied in any way, shape, or form. And before you even ask me, does that answer satisfy you? You said thank you for calling and sharing and didn't get a response from me accordingly and hung up the phone on me. And I, I speak for a number of callers. I'm sure I do, and they're applauding me right now. And, 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 and you know, that's where I'm coming from, Mr. Camping. And, and, now, if God is hanging up the phone on me, fine. Fine, but I don't yeah. think he is. Well, thank you for calling. What? I'm sorry that I can't please you. I'm sorry that I sometimes have to... Uh, say uh, good night when maybe the caller feels like they haven't had a chance to say everything they wish but you must bear in mind this call this program is not just to to satisfy an individual caller because if if that were the case uh, there are many callers who would not be satisfied unless we had an hour long conversation but this program is a teaching program and I and I somehow we have to keep moving it along to go go into uh, to uh, see other opportunity for teaching and so I have to make a call on this that we've talked long enough about this and even though the person that I'm talking with may be completely dissatisfied with the progress of the discussion I'm sorry about that but but uh, uh, I have to think in terms of the purpose of this program it is not simply to to uh, satisfy each and every caller that they have had a chance to air everything they wanted to air but thank you for calling and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hello hello now, let me turn the radio down surely well boy that's only only by the grace of god uh... uh I haven't haven't called for probably a 15 20 years uh brother camping and uh I have tried to call uh when with some of these repeat people and uh, I honor and and uh, praise the uh, the way that you're running this program and and I do hope that the other callers understand that this in fact is a teaching program and uh God bless you for all these years and uh, your ability to keep it going and, and uh, praise God for giving you the health. I, I, I really appreciate that. I'm a, I'm a longtime listener of Family Radio, but was uh, interrupted. We were out in Minnesota for the last four years, and there's not a lot of Family Radio out there, uh, you know, except by shortwave. And so I, I just want to, number one, I'll put a little bug in your ear. They, they need Family Radio out there in Minnesota, Brother Camping. And um, other than that, uh, I just really thank God that that uh, contrary to what a few people have said, that that uh, there is a generation of young people that have grown up on this station, and all they have to do is listen, and they're going to hear them daily. And uh, uh, I have uh, didn't know how much that I would miss family radio till we were separated from it, and we didn't have short wave, but uh, we've always counted it a blessing. Uh, I am separated by space only, uh, not because of divorce from my wife and daughter. Rather, up in uh, up in San Francisco, where my wife is is going to school now, and uh, she's she's right there in in the thicket, and um, is a little bit confused. I I, I uh, sent her the book uh, after the church age. Uh, you were gracious enough to send it to me free of charge, folks. I would urge you to uh, uh, to get it, and then uh, I read it, and uh, I agreed with virtually everything, and and I, you know, thank God that He has revealed these things to you. You know, at this point, uh, she's going to a good church up there, and uh, well, we've talked about the fellowship issue, 
and uh, I just, you know, there's not much more that I can say uh, till uh, she's read the book. But uh, I would just urge people to use the resources that Family Radio offers. Well, Criticize, fine. fine, but please use the resources first and read. And God bless your brother, Campy. Thank you for calling and sharing. Incidentally, there are areas in the United States that we don't have a, an FM or an AM radio, but but uh, they can listen to shortwave. There are certain areas of the world where they don't even have shortwave. Uh, they're getting smaller and smaller because we're trying to blanket the world either with shortwave or with uh, AM radio or with satellite. Uh, uh, wonderfully, more and more people are getting Internet, and so they can hear uh, uh, our programming over Internet, although, again, in third world countries particularly, there are a great many people who don't have access to Internet, even in some of our, our first world countries, if we want to call them that. Uh, there are people who do not have access to Internet. But we are pushing where that is spiritually, or, or we're being as, as aggressive as possible to get every possible uh, means of getting the gospel out there. And we still have ideas that we're working on to continue to go, go so that more and more we blanket the whole world with this gospel that we believe is uh, we're, tr we're t teaching as faithfully as possible. But thank you for calling. We're going to take our last call. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Uh, yes, but it can be. How you doing, sir? Very well, thank you. I have a question. I was listening to a caller that I called earlier, and uh, they brought up the uh, question about the Sabbath. And uh, what I wanted to find out, what, what, which day, in your opinion, is the, is the uh, Sabbath? In the Old Testament, it was the seventh day. It was Saturday that went from uh, uh, sundown on Friday until sundown on Saturday. But when Christ rose from the grave, God indicates in Matthew 28, verse 1, that that era of Sabbath came to an end. They were not to be observed anymore. They were part of the ceremonial law. And God indicated that there's a new era of Sabbath that began that Sunday morning because Christ rose on Sunday. And so today the only proper Sabbath to observe uh, is on Sunday. If you are still observing it on Saturday, then you are going against the Bible. You are setting up your own kind of a of a rule, your own kind of a, 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 a gospel, and you don't want to do that. But I have come to the end of our program, or we all have. We uh, uh, have to make room for the next program. So I want to thank you for permitting me to come in to visit with you. And uh, now, uh, until our next program, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.